that's an indicator for the investors out there is like there are sellers that are going to need to sell. They're coming on market. There's continued pressure there. Uh, and then how you get the deals done, whether you want to go a traditional route, you want to go a creative route, um, you know, you can play into depending on what the seller needs to get out of it. But I think that that's a major takeaway is there are pressures that are applying, right? With inflation increasing and excess savings way down, mm -hmm. people are feeling more and more pressure, which means there's going to be more inventory or there's more opportunity in the market yeah. inherently by the number. Braden, thank you for joining me for our Thought Leader Spotlight Series. I'm your host, Matt Camp, over here at Deal Machine. And on these, we really like to shine an industry spotlight on experts like Braden here, really hear his inspiring story and, and how he sees the world evolving. So today, really excited to welcome on Braden Lambros, uh, the Chief Commercial Officer over at Empora Title. We had on Megan as well, other CEO. Uh, he's a real estate investor and developer himself, um, has been involved with single family, multifamily, commercial storage, all kinds of different assets. Um, also has a background in healthcare tech and then even in raising capital. So he's been a part of companies that have raised over a billion dollars in VC capital. So um, quite a few things to dig into. Uh, welcome on, Braden. Yeah, really excited to be here, Matt. Thanks for hosting. Yeah, man. Uh, can you maybe tell us more about your background, um, especially how you got involved on the real estate front? I know that's really applicable to our audience, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's a uneventful story uh, <laughs> to some extent. Uh, really, when I looked at you know starting my career, I was doing... A lot of uh, consulting and hospital turnarounds, a lot of operational work, bottom line improvement work, uh, and got into healthcare technology and uh, started looking at like, what are the things I want to place capital in? And for some reason, you know, you kept hearing real estate was a good one mm -hmm. for all the reasons, right? You have appreciation, you have depreciation, yeah. you have tax advantaged assets and mm -hmm. things like that. And so I uh, really stumbled into it with a business partner of mine said, hey, let's, let's do this. And, you know, got our, got our first duplex and learned a lot through that one, right? Over invested in. The renovation um, and did a lot of things ourselves, which we never did again after that one. You know, a lot of the lessons that you learn getting into it, I think the biggest part was just getting started, right? There's a lot of people that get caught up in this is the right prop, is it the right property? Do I know what I need to do to it? And to some extent, um, you know, you want to be able to underwrite it as effectively as you can, make sure it cash flows and make sure uh, it's in an area, right, that um, hits the mark that you're looking for. But I think you just have to jump in and get started. And that's what we did. And you kind of learn the lessons over time. You figure out what you want to do, what you don't want to do, um, did some flips and then moved upscale into some of the larger projects uh, over time. Uh, but you kind of have to stumble through it and just make the decision to get going and a commitment to, to learn and get better from, from everything. And that's really what got us into kind of the scaling factor we have today. Yeah, that's a big one, especially for our audience. I know, um, you know, a lot of people, it's, it's really easy to just you know, listen to podcasts like this and, and, you know, take in a lot of information and feel like that someday I'll know enough to get started, but being able to learn through doing, jump into it. And like you said, uh, go through that experience is, is, you know, across the board where we see people having, you know, long-term successes, they took that first step. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it's easy to have that analysis paralysis, but is there anything else in that process, putting yourself in your shoes back then that really helped you guys take that first step? Anything that, uh, you know, you talked about you guys learned some early on lessons like that. Um, and anything else you can share with with newbies on how to overcome that and, and get started on that first deal? Yeah, I think uh, for us, when we went into it, we were just both really motivated to take action. Mm -hmm. And so we just got into it, right? We found a place, we said, this location's good. The price point's right. It needed a renovation. So we looked at something that was like, what can be value add was kind of our first mm -hmm. uh, underwriting uh, philosophy. Uh, and then we looked at a location like this is going to be an appreciating area. Um, it had a lot of other construction going on around it. Uh, so the, the indicators were strong in the area, but there's probably a funny picture I could show you of us, um, sledgehammering in the house, right. As we're going through and, you know, hitting wires and hitting stuff. We're like, we don't know. We had no idea what we were doing. We did no research, uh, in terms of like, how do you demo a house? Right. Mm -hmm. So we learned a lot of things that way. But, um, I think the one thing I would take away the, like probably more so what looking back, what would have been nice to have would have been more of like an advisor or something in the community. Right. There's a lot more available now in assets online and masterminds in these communities that you could just by going to an event in the area, you could meet a contractor. Right. Or you could meet somebody who just did what you did a year ago and made those mistakes. Um, and we just kind of dove in. Right. So that's, you know, lesson learned there a little bit. But that's probably what I would more advise and recommend is there's a lot of people willing to give information and help other investors get started because everyone was in the same position and the access now is so high. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So you have, I mean, between your social media outlets and the community events happening in your area, all you have to do is go on Facebook, right? And you can find the local events and go to a couple of different ones and meet some people and you're going to meet somebody who's willing to help you. Yeah. And I think that's like, if you're really looking at, you, you're like unsure about underwriting or you want a second check, like somebody in that community would be willing to hop on the phone, hop on a Zoom, have coffee and walk you through, you know, how to make this work and what you're looking for. And I think that's, um, probably the most important thing you can do if you're ready to take action, but you're kind of on the fence, yeah. uh, you have to make the decision to do it and then look at, look to um, others in the community and kind of use the power community to help prop you up and mm -hmm. get going. That's something we talk about often on, I mean, we do quite a few trainings and demos and things where it's uh, across the board leading with action, like you said, leading by doing and, and you know, that, that kind of massive and perfect action that uh, Brent Daniels will talk about often. Um, and then, you know, also having that on-demand knowledge to tap into where you've got a little bit of a safety net, you've got, you know, the, the ability to come back to somebody and say, Hey, what would you do here? What would I, you know, learn from each other and, uh, really have that kind of, uh, mentor to fall back on is, is huge. I know, um, we really actively focus on that at Deal Machine. We've got our, our master classes we host once a week, uh, for everybody who's a Deal Machine pro member and up, uh, as you know come there and ask questions and learn from each other and, and have an expert to ask about that. So we'll have to have Megan on one of those at some point. Too. Yeah, she'd be great. And that's like a, that's big for us, you know, as a, a core value at Empora too, that we, we have four core values, but the one that you're speaking to is growth over perfection. Mm -hmm. And it's like, get going, be being committed to learn. And then, um, you know, always do a retro and understand like, Hey, I made the decision. It was the wrong one. So like be okay saying, mm -hmm. Hey, I made this, I, this was what I knew then. This is what I know now. Mm -hmm. I can come to terms that it wasn't the best decision, but I did it, mm -hmm. but it gets you going, right? So yep. you can't, in this business, and in really any business, you can't over-index on being perfect. It's just, it's not going to get you where you need to. I think Brent Daniel says it very well. Yeah, absolutely. So, so speaking on Impora, how did you get involved with Impora Title? Like, and, and then also what got you so excited to, to join the team? Yeah, so, you know, through the different, um, through the different work that I'd done over the years and the different investing, I had worked with 40, 50 title companies or more, right? And I, I saw this problem that was just every time of, you never know what's going on. You do all the work to find the deal, you do all the work to underwrite it, yep. you do all the work to maybe get approvals and zoning. You just don't really know what's going on though on that last 100 meters of your 400 meter race, right? So it's like, I wanna find the property uh, is kind of your first 100. And then you look it through all your underwriting and evaluation and zoning where it's applicable. Um, but it's really that last hundred meters of, I have a purchase contract, I've done everything and I just need to get this to, to done. So that experience just felt in, in a consumer driven world where experience expectations are so high in everything we do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's buying a car, whether it's um, buying things online, right? It was like mm -hmm. this evolution that we've had of instant gratification and always having visibility and transparency into, and like the, I want it now yep. mentality um, just didn't exist. And so that was one, that was something that I personally experienced. And then meeting with our founder, Megan, uh, was really enlightening that somebody had identified something and there's like attributes to what type of markets can be disrupted. Right. And I look at them and I say, Hey, we have, you know, something that's highly fractured, um, as a starting point, something that's hyper localized or regionalized is another one. Like those are assets. If you look back 20, 25 years, you say like local bookstore, mm -hmm right? And you insert Amazon into it. Yep. It's like, um, you have to use technology to disrupt a technology. If you find that type of market and those, uh, specifics, uh, that make up an opportunity for disruption, that was one. So you looked at it and you said like, highly localized, I was like, check. I was like, I've experienced the pains of it and know what is a consumer I want to have, um, as part of this transaction. And oftentimes for, for buyers, for sellers, whether they're first time or investors, it's highly anxious, right? People's, mm -hmm. people's life and livelihood actually depend on it. Like putting food on their table, getting out of a tough situation, um, paying payroll, mm -hmm. right? It's a big, it's the biggest check of the month for somebody on that is on the investor team. Like all those things are really important. And so you say like, this needs to be kind of turned on its head. Mm -hmm. And so it was something that I've always been a fan of not doing what everyone else does, like thinking about outside the box and saying like, how do we disrupt this? How do we change it? I think that's like kind of a core tenant of the business is how do we challenge the status quo of title, mm -hmm. right? It shouldn't be that opaque. It should be, I know what I need to do. I know when I need to do it. I know if it's on or off track. Uh, and I even, I know what I'm paying for, quite yeah. frankly. And so that's what, um, you know, and in lieu of that, people typically say, I love my title company because I have one person that's a great communicator. 
but you really have to look at it and say like, well, you have, that's a great experience because that's the status quo, mm -hmm. right? In absence of any other software or experiences being driven through what we expect when we buy something on Amazon um, or in any of these other uh, experiences that we have day in and day out, booking a reservation <laughs> online, right? right? Yeah. So that just didn't exist 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, I think that this market is, is heavily, it's archaic. It operates in the eighties. The biggest step functions for the most part that have happened was email. Mm -hmm. And so it just had all the makeup of how do we provide a better experience, um, at the price you're paying and, uh, make it easy for people, less anxious, uh, more enjoyable. And, um, I think those are all big assets and attributes of like what the market needs to be and what yeah. people want. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that was really like what got me excited and talking with Megan about the things I mentioned, uh, it was just like, Hey, this is a huge opportunity. I felt the problem, right? I talked to my friends who are investors, uh, or agents, right. About the problem. They all have the same thing to say. So it's a hard problem to solve, right? It's, it's heavily Absolutely. complex. It's very, very nuanced. Uh, and most people don't understand it. It's, it. There's so much that goes into it. Um, they just want the outcome, right? Like they just want to know right. what it's at, when's it going to be done and when are we closing and when do I get my money? Mm -hmm. And so we have to, you know, work through building systems and experiences that make that consistent, reliable, uh, and generate that same experience every single time. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, like, like you mentioned, it can be an intimidating, you know, thing to go through and transact, you know, the entire process. That was something that we broke down with Megan earlier. Um, you know, and also speaking to, in terms of, uh, kind of uncertainty and going through that, one thing that can hold people back from, you know, leading with that action can be the, the market overall, which I mean, the market, that's a broad, <laughs> a broad term, obviously lumping everything together. Um, you know, I know you came with, uh, some, some great, uh, you know, research on your end, you're, you're very data driven in terms of how you approach things. Um, you know, obviously we've heard a lot of news recently and, and you know, depending upon when you're watching this, this is what, December 19th or 18th? Yeah. Uh, 19th? Yeah. It changes quick. Um, yeah. It changes quick. I know we've heard, uh, you know, good news from the fed about planning to cut rates and all kinds of different things going on in the world right now. Um, but there's regardless, a lot of uncertainty. So mm -hmm. how would you kind of address that in terms of just using that lens of data when it comes to affordability, when it comes to how investors should think about next year, you know, 2024, can you, can you kind of give us a breakdown there of what you say? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the, the big headline for what we're facing in the United States right now is affordability, right? I mean, that's like, that is the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. um, and to support that, it's 2023 in terms of purchasing homes uh, was the least affordable year in over a decade, and some could argue like history of us having data assets. Um, so, you know, at least over the last 10, 20, 30 years, it was the most, it was the least affordable. And to put numbers on it, uh, it is, it's over a thousand to $1,100 more, 50% higher today. If you're going to buy a home today, maybe even last week with rates have changed a little bit, um, then renting. So when we talk about, like we talk about affordability or unaffordability, it's really through, through the lens of how much do I pay every month? Mm -hmm. And so right now it's almost 50% higher, $1,100 a month. So that's like, uh, a really big indicator. When you look at what is the makeup of affordability, you have a price of home, uh, you have the interest rates, right? And then what impacts both of those is supply. Right. Um, and so right now you look at the markets really interesting where what percentage of homes do you think people own outright with no mortgage? First homes. Isn't it 40 something percent? Yeah, it's really high. When yeah. I heard that number, I was really taken back. It's like yeah. 42 or 44%. Like shocking, percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's shock, yeah, I had no idea. Uh -huh. So you look at that and you say, okay, so then you have a subset of, well, of those that have mortgages, uh -huh. um, you have to look at the percentages that go into it. And it's like, so for the other 60% roughly that have a mortgage, uh, you have 90% or under 6%. Uh -huh. uh, and then you have 60, over 60% that are under 4%. Yeah, they're locked in. They're so they're locked, they're locked in, in, right? The affordability, the appreciation of these markets has increased so dramatically, some more than others, but pretty much everywhere across the board. Uh -huh. um, so that's influencing like supply, right? People aren't moving. The number of uh, homes that are you know up for sale or pending home sales is down over 50% from three years ago because uh, people are locked in and that comes back to affordability. It's like, yep. I could sell it at a premium, but where do I go? Mm -hmm. So people aren't moving right? and it, it's causing, um, it's causing that lock. So when you think about affordability then in terms of like real numbers, there are, there's a really interesting edgy stat. It came from a, uh, Came from an economist from Moody's. So in order for affordability to come back down to what it was just a few years ago, you have a couple, there's really like three levers to pull. You have rates, uh, you have price of home, 
and you have income. Mm -hmm. And so to put numbers on that, and this is like two weeks old, so just to preface with rates coming down a little bit, but in order to get back to uh, a couple of years ago from an affordability index, rates have to get to at least five and a half percent. And this is, these are absolute, so there's obviously a flex piece in here. Right. Rates could drop, you know, get to at least five and a half percent. Income could increase 28%. Or the average home price in the country could decrease 22%. So you're not going to get an absolute. I don't. I wouldn't expect in any of those levers. Uh, but those are the three factors at play to drive affordability up in terms of like the macroeconomic picture. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important also as you're looking and listening uh, at for opportunities. Like it is hyper localized, right? So you have appreciation in Florida. If you look at the the rates in Florida and the, the the cost of home in Florida, yes, they've seen 30, 40, 50% appreciation over since over the last two or three years, mm -hmm. um, but they haven't gone, had pulled back off a peak, right? You take Austin, Texas um, or Arizona, which maybe had that same type of 30, 40, 50% increase, but they've actually come down 10 to 20% off peak numbers mm -hmm. of 21. And so it is, it is important as you think about affordability is like it, it does become hyper localized to mm -hmm. some extent. So understanding the macro picture is important, but looking deeper into your market and understanding your market is, is more important than Absolutely. the bigger dynamic picture. Yeah. I think a lot, you know, we'll have guests on reinforce that pretty often with us where it's like, you know, the market is, that's a broad uh, paintbrush, right? It's yeah. going to be dependent upon where you're based out of. So, um, you know, regardless of what, happens next year and as you're talking through affordability and all that do you have any recommendations on real estate investors uh what people who are you know aspiring real estate investors talking about like well should i buy now should i wait like how do you approach this market how can you do you have any recommendations on getting deals done in any market really well, yeah i think it i think it still comes back to um like how you underwrite the deals mm -hmm. right so can you make the deals make sense i think when you're when you're looking at if you're an investor or a wholesaler um, or fix and flipper, right? Or you're doing commercial. It just comes back to like, can the deals pencil? Uh, and, and building in like something to say, like it's an appreciation play is probably not as favorable as saying like, do the numbers work right now the way that interest rates are um, with the numbers that I have, not knowing like, will rates go down and I can refi or not? So like, how do you make, does cash flow work today? Mm -hmm. Right, I think is really important. So does this thing make money or not? Um, when you look at the Fed side of it, you know, you went from this goes like this is just a two week. Now we're almost three weeks. So December 1st, you know, the Fed came out and said, like, the major headline was it's premature to speculate a rate cut in 2024. And then on the 13th, which was two less than two weeks later, they're saying, how can we the headline was something to the tune of like, how can we make sure that um, how can we start addressing like rate cuts? And there's basically the potential of rate cuts occurring in 24. So that's just like a Fed change in two weeks. Right. Um, and so now you're getting to where economists were saying, like, there could be up to six rate cuts. Uh, Powell and the Fed just came out a couple of days ago and said, like, they could expect three. Uh, and that could be as soon as March, right, would be the first one. Um, but if you're looking at the deals, you have to say, like, well, it comes back to, like, does this deal work right now? Mm -hmm. Right. And because you don't know what's going to happen. Like, inherently, if rate cuts come down, then, like, affordability has gone up a little bit. It's going to bring buyers into the market. Right. So I think it still comes back to like the fundamentals. And, you know, if you want to do deals, like there are deals out there. We work with hundreds of investors that do, you know, hundreds of deals a year. Mm -hmm. And they have gotten really good at saying, I find a deal. I know what the numbers need to look like. I can underwrite it well. I know what my budget's going to be to uh, upgrade or rehab this. And as long as you can hit those numbers and the numbers come back all right, it's, you know, I think there, you can't let the, can't let rates scare you. you can't let that because you don't know i mean if you did that a couple of years ago right you know you missed so a huge boat and, yeah and i don't I, I think it's it's unfair to say like we're going to see massive um decreases in the um home prices too mm -hmm. right it's it you can't do like if i had a you know a ball that i could look into and tell you i could you know, then I'd be worth a lot more money. Right, no one knows that. Yeah, hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, I think it comes back to the fundamentals on it. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, in the end, that's what we're trying to preach over here is is buying right. You know, and that's you know our goal with with Deal Machine is really to help you find people you can really solve a problem for, and and, and in that process, buy right. You know, trade discount or inequity on a deal for solving someone's problem. Um, so you know, that, that's really uh, across the board. No matter what happens with the market, I think if you approach that and buy right, you're going to you know be a 
be uh, you know, future proofing yourself to some extent. Yeah, so. and the best investors are still doing a lot of deals. We mm -hmm. see a lot of new investors coming into the market. They're finding mm -hmm. great deals. So the deals are out there. Uh, the other thing that's probably like a major takeaway in terms of opportunity as well is you have to look at like, in these areas of the stress sellers or, or sellers in general, mm -hmm. like you can put it on a scale. I know Pace Morby says this, but it's like, what do they have to, they're going to have one of these two levers. Like do they have a pain or they have something in the game, right? So they in a position where they're looking for a premium price, they can wait for it, mm -hmm. or are they in a distressed position? Mm -hmm. And so in the United States over the last like 24 months, excess savings has decreased dramatically, like over 90%. So mm -hmm. excess savings in the country uh, was over $2 trillion just two years ago. And now it's into the 200 billion range wow. and with the 80, with the bottom 80% having living month to month mm -hmm. and having no excess savings. And so what, what that's an indicator for the investors out there is like, there are sellers that are going to need to sell. They're coming on market. There's continued pressure there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then how you get the deals done, whether you want to go a traditional route, you want to go a creative route. Um, you know, you can play into depending on what the seller needs to get out of it. But I think that that's a major takeaway is. There are pressures that are applying, right? With inflation increasing and excess savings way down, mm -hmm. people are feeling more and more pressure, which means there's gotta be more inventory or there's more opportunity in the market yeah. inherently and, by the numbers. And you're more valuable you're as an investor. Like you can come in and, and truly help those people in terms of, you know, if they're dealing with the situation. Like you come in and find that win-win scenario where they're very excited to be able to do that with you. So, yeah, and, I mean, um, we have we have an yeah. investor uh, that just does an amazing job and he really focuses on seniors. Mm -hmm. And so he helps like, the business that he started was wholesale and flipping, and he still does some of that, but really he's focused on the senior arm. Mm -hmm. And the senior arm for him has been great because for him, it's very rewarding, right? He's getting these people out of the position that they need to be in uh, and into a home. So like, mm -hmm. he actually sees it all the way through of like, not only am I helping them out of the position that they're in today, but I'm making sure that they end up in a better place. Mm -hmm. And for him, that's very fulfilling. And I think for a lot of people you know, in the country, that would be. Um, and so I just think that you're going to see more and more of those opportunities, especially in the, and you have an aging population. Yep. So mm -hmm. all those factors is like, there's deals out there. Yep. Yep. You, you got to keep going. Or as Deanne Sanders says, keep making plays. <laughs> Love it. There we go. <laughs> good, good, uh, good stuff here. This has been fantastic. Um, last question I had on my end, uh, as well. I know we're coming up on time a little bit here too. Uh, I know you've had some roles, obviously in tech, um, you know, you're an executive director of AI transformation strategy, um, you know, a, a company and in general, like it's a, you know, this be able to stay ahead of the market by embracing technology is something that we want to give our customers. Do you, do you have any recommendations on investors, how to embrace tech, how to embrace AI, how to, you know, where you think, see things heading? Like, do you have any advice there? Um, yeah. We were building machine learning models before people really knew what they were and, you know, mm -hmm. data science and artificial intelligence or AI has, has been around for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. It's really like a programming system uh, that you put inputs in and it makes predictions. And there's all different varying levels and degrees of simple to complex. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of the day, I think what really helped people understand what AI's potential is, was ChatGPT. I know a lot of people talk about that. I think the LLMs have a huge impact and opportunity uh, in how you leverage them, whether you're, you're using them for marketing generation or job postings or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. or you're building software, right? So, I mean, the, the ability now to be able to prompt, they call it prompt engineering, mm -hmm. to be able to prompt it, to be able to do, build code. I mean, you can, I know technologists and entrepreneurs that have built entire software MVPs in a couple of weeks mm -hmm. themselves, strictly through prompt engineering. These were people that did hardcore software engineering for a long time. And then, you know, went into leadership and ran companies and then stepped back down to start something new and are doing it themselves because of the abilities of the technology uh, and, and the ability to leverage it. And so I think that it's really important that people start to just like, just start using it mm -hmm. for whatever it is that, you, you know, if you're in software and use it for prompt engineering for code, right? Uh, if you're using it for design, like if you apply it to real estate, there's different applications out there of like, I want to go through all these different designs, mm -hmm. right? And I can get, I can in, in put a floor plan in, right? Or I can put pictures in and say, this is the picture today. It's like, give it a, a modern design with a California flair, right? And yeah. it's like prompting, it's like, boom, here it is. And you're like, okay, I want it to be more cost, you know, conscious. And it's like scaled down. It's like scale up, scale down. And so I think that that's an ability to, um, a very simple one that's applicable to say like, hey, I don't know anything about design. Mm -hmm. um, you could work with a designer, but designers are going to, start if they aren't already using it as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you have to go in and go into it eyes wide open and say like, what's the problem? 
and then start just using it. Yeah. Right. Because it is, it's impacting everything around us. It's, it, we're surrounded by it. Um, it's obviously feeding, you know, if you talk about something and all of a sudden you see a social ad for it, yeah. um, it's feeding into there, but there's a lot of applications for it. I think that one I mentioned from a design standpoint is just one of them. Um, but it's becoming more and more real world and it's going to, for the people that adopt it, you're going to have an acceleration in terms of competitive advantage or lack thereof right. um, over the next couple of years. Yeah. Embracing it is that product can be tool to, to kind of give you superpowers there, you know? Right? Yeah. I know on our end, like the, the, the deal machine front, if you're on deal machine pro and up, you get access to Alma, our AI real estate assistant. And it's us, you know, using chat GPT, combining, you know, a, a ton of prompting that we put on our, on our end and then our off market property data. So people can jump in there and actually figure out on the go in the, in the mobile app, even just say like, Hey, here's a property. Could this be a good deal to wholesale or flip or buy and hold? And it'll help you do analysis right there using AI, um, help you come up with ways to reach out to sellers and what language to use and all of that. So it's kind of like a little uh, real estate assistant in your pocket there too. Yeah. It's almost like, you. I mean, the concept is like, how do you put a human in the loop, right? The mm -hmm. loop of the information, the loop of an advisor uh, mm -hmm. or digital assistant that you have. Like when we looked at it, we've been looking at it from an Empora standpoint. And it's like a lot of the work that happens today in title is, um, taking information, putting it in a system, taking information, putting it in a system. So the things we've been applying it to is how do we, from a purchase contract, right? Purchase contract comes in, can take everything out of it mm -hmm. to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. Title search comes back and take everything out of it. And basically you can, you can take the human out of the mundane task and just get them into the higher value work. And so as we think about application for us, it's the actual operation behind the scenes and the work that happens. So like, how do we make that more streamlined? Uh, that also enables us to put in uh, stronger foothold and um, specifics around the data inputs. So making them structured uh, mm -hmm. that we can use later for a ton of different data insights that we want. Uh, and then also get into the consumer experience side, right? A lot of uh, companies have evolved and technologies evolved so fast for anyone that's used like travel software mm -hmm. um, out there. They most of, almost all of them have some type of AI assistant now where, hey, is this the flight you're inquiring about? Do you want to change it? Do you want to mm -hmm. uh, cancel it? Right. There's all these different things that lead to a better uh, experience without having a human and getting you answers at your fingertips fast. And then, you know, if it takes a, um, a different route and requires human intervention, then a human jumps in, right. You yep. put a human back in the loop, but for 80% of the work uh, and getting to the answers that a lot of that can be done now through the advancements in, in AI. Yeah, love love the advice of it, embracing it and getting in there and figuring out how you can use it. So, yeah. um, Brayden, this has been fantastic, man. So, uh, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, you know, uh, is there, there anywhere to get involved with Empora as well uh, for our audience? Yeah, you um, you can look EmporaTitle dot com. You can look us up, create a profile, submit your deal seamlessly right through it. So that's the fastest mm -hmm. way. Um, we've got a great team. You can you can access us through you know our phone numbers or social profiles um, online. And uh, my Twitter's, you know, at Brain Lambros. So that's an easy way to, to get a hold of me. But, you know, glad to get in touch with any of the investors out there. Would love to talk more about what you're doing, how I can help you, um, how we can help you. You know, we've, we have an amazing team uh, of people that specialize exclusively in investors. Mm -hmm. And so they're just a wealth of knowledge when it comes to getting deals done, keeping them on track, giving you advice in the system on how you can improve your process mm -hmm. based on the data that we see. Um, how to better work with your sellers, right? Position them and set them up for success. Uh, so we'd love to partner with you. We'd love to, you know, join your community uh, and, and hope that you get in touch with us soon. Fantastic. Yeah. So we'll link to all that below. Um, again, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you guys, yeah. especially in person, the special in-person edition. So, yeah, it's great. Thanks. Um, Thanks, fantastic. Matt. Thanks for having us. Awesome. And uh, Matt Camp over here again with Deal Machine and happy deal fun.